Okay, I've now gotten my hands on an engineering prototype of this product. It's not the finished version. You would typically only encounter something like this at a trade show or exhibition. Let's take a quick look at its general exterior. On the top, there are two rows of touch control ports, and inside, I can see what looks like an aluminum fin, specifically a nickel-plated aluminum fin. Over here, there's a USB Type-C port, and right next to that, we have a USB-A port, followed by a 3.5mm headphone jack. All right, now let's turn our attention to the bottom. Down here, you'll find the newly incorporated M2 1517 SSD slot, located right in this area. And underneath, there's another Type-C port. Now let's look at the buttons on the front. Here are the four A, B, X, Y function buttons. They're crystal. You can see the reflection. This is the right joystick, and on this side we have two function keys, one of them being an optical track point. All right, then over here you'll find a back button, a home button, and right here is the power button, a mirror key, and finally the up and down power buttons. Okay, let's see the back. Okay, there's a battery connector here. There are two fans, and this section features a triangular structure designed to hold the battery in place. This mechanism is used to adjust the trigger, allowing you to switch between a micro-switch and a linear response, effectively toggling between the trigger and micro-switch functions. Additionally, there's an L4 button located here, which is a controller accessory, and an R4 button on the other side. Now let's take a look at its battery. Alright, first, let me give you a quick demonstration. I'll take a look at the battery right away. It's truly lightweight. Now regarding this battery, let's take a look at the back. It's right here in my hand, a Wenwu battery with a rated capacity of 80 watt hours and the milliamp hours are at least 15.48 volts, making it 5,170 milliamp hours. You can see there's a particular interface on the back located right here. A triangular structure and a spring clip. As you can see, you can press it with your hand. And when you press it, it can be securely fastened to the back of the device's main body. Now, as for the battery socket located underneath, it's quite similar to the ones found on older laptop models. This means that this particular machine is now powered by a DC. DC power cable to power it on. Let's go ahead and install the battery, then we'll take a look at how it works. I need to press this power button here. Alright, let's take a look. It has attached the battery pack. Can you see that? Once it's installed, because the air intake for the heat sink is located underneath, it has provided this specific air inlet to ensure that the heat sink isn't obstructed and can function properly, allowing for proper airflow. To draw in air, preventing it from being, shall we say, suffocated. Also, this area offers two sets of air inlets for auxiliary intake, specifically designed to assist with air intake when the battery pack is installed. I believe this design is quite effective. They've only opened the four holes on the left and right side. The central ones remain closed. Let's check if the battery is detected. As you can see, the battery isn't being detected right now. Let's restart it. Okay, while it's restarting, let's take a look at another one of its accessories. This is its base, a Type-C base, and on the back there's a USB-A interface, an RJ45 port, an HDMI port, and a Type-C input. Uh, the very top part is specifically a base designed for charging the battery pack. Here's an interface, so we can place the machine on it like this, onto this interface. And you can see... It has this port pre-configured on its back. So, just placing it like this enables charging or provides an expansion option. Alright, let's check if its battery has been recognized. Okay, the battery has indeed been detected and is now at 89%, which means it was only recognized after the device restarted. Alright, now, next, let's delve into its specifications. Of course, these are not the final specifications. After we assess its performance, we see the processor is an AMX 395W, and the current memory is 2 GB. For the actual mass production version, this processor will not be paired with this specific processor, nor will it come with this amount of memory. Alright, now let's examine the integrated graphics card, the 8060S. Okay, let's zoom in a bit. The display screen on this device is actually the same model that's used in the GPD Win Mini. Let's head over to the display settings now, and then specifically, we'll check out the advanced display settings. Uh, it's 100. 1280 by 720 resolution, which is perfectly acceptable. Now I'll gauge its weight and then contrast it with its dimensions. 
I brought a GPD Win Mini, the white unit, to compare. Let's examine its storage capacity. When I place both devices side by side, you can clearly see that its length is just a bit more extended than the Win Minis. Let's examine this ratio and make a comparison. This particular model is the 2025 version of the Win Mini. We should definitely take a moment to observe its thickness. If you choose to include the battery pack, it does become quite substantial in terms of thickness. However, if you opt not to use the battery pack, it remains exceptionally lightweight. Take a good look. All right. Let's set this one aside for a moment. Over here, we also have a WinMax 2. Let's do a quick comparison. You'll notice that the WinMax 2 is considerably smaller when placed side by side. Even so, the WinMax 2 itself is still quite substantial and heavy. Wow, this WinMax 2 is seriously weighty, even heavier than this device when it has its battery installed. Now I'll assess the overall feel and grip in my hand. The battery is positioned here and when I hold the device, my hand generally won't touch it. It won't affect my hand, but if you choose to grip it in a certain way, it might cause an issue. However, if it's held in a semi-grip state like this. Ah, the effect is actually very good. Let me see if they've included it this time. No, they haven't included that controller, specifically the mouse toggle key for simulating a mouse. Previous models all featured such a toggle key, but this one lacks it. Honestly, I find this particular button quite useless, and there's also a memory card slot here. The feel is excellent. Lastly, let me show you one more thing. It comes with this DC power supply. Let's check it out. This device can be powered either through a DC power supply or by utilizing a Type-C connection. The main benefit of using the DC power cable is its higher wattage output. Let's find out how much power it provides. As you can see, this DC power supply delivers 180 watts. However, if you opt for the Type-C, it probably won't be able to provide that 180 watt power supply. Okay, so that's pretty much how it works. For the precise internal specifications and intricacies, I believe we'll need to await the engineering prototype that's due at the end of the month. It's expected to be in a closed beta testing environment by then. We currently have the battery connected while the device is powered on. Why are we disconnecting it? Well, let's observe what happens. Once we remove it, we can easily take off this connector. Now let's see the computer's reaction. It's still displaying that the power is connected, which is quite interesting. The battery is presently linked to the device. This is actually a Windows issue, because when Windows is powered on, its battery information detection is quite delayed, meaning it takes a considerable amount of time before it will notify you that your battery is currently disconnected. Okay, so without the battery installed, holding just this, it weighs around 500 grams. It's truly super light. Alright, I'll stop the demonstration here for now. Okay, I'll shut it down. Let's take a look at its internal structure for heat dissipation. Inside, we can see it's an engineering prototype. It hasn't had any surface treatment yet. You can see it still has that natural brass color. And here, I believe, is a heat pipe cooling module. Lastly, I'd like to mention that it has an extension cable at the back that can directly connect to the power supply. You can use this power extension cable to link it with the battery pack. However, at this current exhibition, TPDP hasn't yet finalized this cable. Therefore, we can observe that there are two threaded ports on its side, and these threads are intended for securely fastening it. These screws that securely fasten it, very similar to the mechanism on a VGA connector. Once you've screwed it in on this side, it can also be screwed in on the other side, and the stability and reliability of the battery interface connection will be greatly improved. Hmm, I think this is very well done. And we can also see its mouse toggle key, which now has now transformed into a convenient panel switch located right here. It enables effortless switching between the game controller and a mouse with just a single press. Personally, I find this particular design to be a significant enhancement compared to the older toggle button. Additionally, the power button is thoughtfully equipped with an LED light, which I believe is a great touch. Observing its exterior, the motherboard's dimensions are roughly in this area, at the connection point between the curved and flat surfaces. 
and it's similar on the other side. So, with a motherboard of this size, and with connectors at both the top and bottom, the motherboard must certainly have a top and bottom edge structure. This means the 3951 Max's motherboard is extremely large, effectively filling the interior very completely, which is why a dual fan cooling module like this is essential to manage and keep the heat dissipation under control. Alright, we're going to proceed with a burn-in test for the computer. I see that ADA64 is on the desktop, which is very good. Let's try to open it. Oh, I clicked the wrong icon by mistake. Let's start it up, and let's also launch ADA64. As you can see, this is a relatively old version, so I'm not entirely sure if it will be able to read the sensor information. Currently, I don't have the battery installed. I'm directly using DC power. Let's take a look at the computer sensor. Let's see what information it can get. It's collecting information. How much time is this going to take? Ah, okay. It's displayed now. We can see that this AIDA64 software is able to show us the central processing unit's temperature, as well as the graphics processing unit's temperature. And also the temperature of this SSD. So let's proceed directly to selecting the system stability test tool. We will only tick the FPU option. The turbo boost should not have been adjusted. It's in its default state. Now we click on GPU disk. Let's observe the situation. Oh my bad, I'm blocking the view. Oh my goodness, it's currently pulling 70 watts, 70 watts. This is just a GPU stress test, and I haven't even turned on the FPU yet. Let's go ahead and activate the FPU now. Okay. Oh, its total power consumption is only 70 watts. This means that once I enable the FPU, it will take power away from the GPU, but its upper limit on power consumption has already been restricted. So, let's just turn off the FPU for now. We'll only focus on this. I'll disable the CPU's FPU, and we'll solely observe the GPU's temperature situation. Let's examine the center. Processor's temperature. Actually, the GPU and the CPU are built on the same core die, so their temperatures are quite similar, as 70 and 73 degrees Celsius are not significantly different. Let's run this test and observe the results. It's too noisy here. I can't hear the sound of its fan at all. I can't hear a thing. The ambient noise here is quite loud, so that's why I can't hear it. 70 watts. That means for this DC power, as for the docking station, I've actually detached the Type-C cable from the back. I've connected two ports for power delivery. Since I'm still not entirely certain about its current power supply situation, I'm going to avoid connecting it to two ports, and we'll just set it down. Once it's in place, we'll begin to monitor its performance during operation. When is the optimal time to observe it, you ask? Oh, the airflow from these two ports underneath is quite substantial, so I'm going to take it out right now to inspect it more closely. The pressure from this fan is really strong. Both of these are high-pressure fans. High pressure fans with a high density startup. Let's run it for 5 minutes, or rather 10 minutes. Afterward, we'll examine its surface temperature and also check the core temperature of the processor to see its current status. The temperature is actually still on the rise right now. I'd estimate the ambient temperature is currently around 25 degrees Celsius, primarily because I'm feeling quite warm myself. Okay, it's already five minutes now. Let's take a look. It has the ADA64 stress testing software installed. All right, let's proceed. It's currently operating at 70 watts. The current temperature has now reached 76 degrees Celsius, and the processor is at 77 degrees Celsius. 
As for the SSD, it's a 522 gigabyte drive from Byway installed inside. Actually, the SSD is not the most critical component here. It's likely the fan causing these temperatures. Many of these components are just for testing purposes. The SSD itself is hovering around 55 degrees Celsius. The physical structure itself is designed in such a way that once the battery is removed, the main unit becomes extremely lightweight, truly very light. Now, let's observe the CPU's temperature, which has already reached approximately 78 degrees. We've just started it. Oh, don't pay attention to this one because I ran this later. You can't see the one that isn't running yet. Let's just focus on the system time. We'll go ahead and close this, as I haven't conducted an FPU test. 310 frames per second, oh my goodness, wow. This frame rate is absolutely insane. It's unbelievably high, oh my goodness. This specific weight, 340 grams. The main unit itself is only a little over 500 grams. So it provides a feature like this, see? I can plug in the DC power directly. Or there's also another power cord right here that I can connect it to. You can easily slip this into your pocket. And this part is very convenient to hold. It's not at all heavy. Here, give it a try. Just hold it and experience it for yourself. I'm pointing my phone at it right now. It's so light that I mean the performance is really good, like a 4060 level graphics card, a 4060. I am so excited, you know, just incredibly excited. 300 frames, are you excited about this? Haha, -ha. this performance is truly unbelievably powerful. It's still quite a pleasant surprise. The core temperature is currently at zero degrees, which is perfectly fine. There's almost no significant heat on the left or right sides. When I'm at home, I can just power it up this way. Exactly. I really want to have one of these. Yeah, if one isn't sufficient, I'll just bring another one. Ha <laughs> ha. Now let's examine its surface temperature. Let's take a look at this machine. We're checking the surface temperature of the device. Right now, with a 70 watt GPU undergoing a single stress test, let's take a look at the controller. Oh, the left side of the controller, this spot feels a bit warm. As you can see, the temperature here is approximately 42 to 43 degrees Celsius. The bottom part of the controller is generally quite cool, not diverging much from the surrounding environmental temperature. In the central area, beneath the screen, that's where the motherboard resides, specifically the display chip so it does generate some warmth. Now let's examine the right-hand controller. You'll notice that the right controller exhibits almost no heat generation whatsoever, because currently it, yes, it's not actually using the battery at all. Let's take a look at the back side of it. Let's take a look at the top. The temperature after contact is around 46 to 45 degrees Celsius, and the left side is a bit warmer than the right side. You can see inside the highest temperature measured, 55 degrees, is from an internal component, not the external case. The case itself is around 44 degrees. Let's take a look at the back. Uh, looking at the heat radiation distribution on the back, we can observe that it primarily originates from the two fin areas where heat is generated. All right. The handle sections essentially do not emit any heat, remaining quite cool. Furthermore, the battery interface below is likely experiencing heat radiation from the motherboard, which rises to this connection point. We can pick it up. The DC power supply should have a rather high tolerance, as it shows no indication whatsoever of heating up. We can lift it to examine it. Let's inspect the bottom. At the bottom, we can likewise observe that the internal FJ interface is the source of the temperature. Okay. Now, let's take a look at the graphics settings for Black Myth, Wukong. For the resolution, we have it set to 1600 by 900. FSR is enabled and will adjust the super sampling to 100. Frame generation is also turned on. As for the general settings, it's configured for medium-high graphics quality. Let's go ahead and apply these changes. Let's check the fluidity. Right now, this machine 
uh, I'm looking at the CPU's core status, which is at 57 watts. So approximately, the GPU's power consumption is right there as well, at 56. Over 80 frames, the fluidity is simply awesome. And the shadows, this graphics quality is superb. This is simply incredible. Well, that wraps up my hands-on experience here for now. Wow.